I'm from Mohammad Rehan here from Association of International Dentistry. Dr. Rishan is with us, and we are going to continue on session second of Anatomy of TMJ. Hope so. You, you have liked our session one. Now we will continue to our session two, and then by the next week, inshallah, the session third will be. Dr. Rishan, kindly continue. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My students, dear colleagues, dental surgeon, private practitioner, fellows of International College of Dentists, and everybody listening to this uh, series of uh, temporomandibular giant anatomy. Today we are going to have the second portion. In first portion, we covered uh, that is the development of the TMJ. To some extent, slightly we have touched the histology, and then we have gone for the detail of uh, all the giant uh, action, movement, and uh, with special reference to synovial tag. Today we will uh, emphasize especially on the temporomandibular giant because the development is over, histology is over, and now we are coming to the main point. The bones of the giant, when we describe as a temporomandibular giant, it's a wonderful giant, having a unique synovial properties. It's a wonderful in such a pattern that in the body, it's the only one U-shape bone that is mandible having two equally symmetrical oriented by weight by length and by means of angulation two joints moving at the same ratio moving with a very equilibrium with its muscles and performing the maximum movement of the body any joint is going to perform that is the temporomandibular giant having the capability of movement throughout the day and it's a maximum joint which we use to move it has a very good articular uh, surfaces covered by the fibrocartilage instead of the hyaline cartilage with the maximum synovial joints has to do it is dihydral because it moves very freely and having double movement, that is the sliding and ginglioid movement, we will discuss in detail. It is made up of two basic bones, that is one is called as the condyle and second is called the condyle of the mandible and the mandibular force of the temporal bone. Now, if you look at this photograph, you get the picture that both the giant are very equal distance having exact equilibrium of the angulation on both sides see at the base and see the distance between the foramen magnum and other structures and a very equal measured type of movement on the right side and if you see it moving on the left side and I would see the difference in every corner that it is an absolutely balanced uh, uh, joint. And that, that is the main thing in this uh, property in this joint. If you look at this, is the uh, bone is zygomatic, this is a um, maxillary, that is uh, ramus of the mandible. Here we come, then we will see that this is our condylar process. And this condylar process has the uh, uh, articulation. This is coronoid process, and that is the mandibular notch. And then we will see that uh, this is the area of the neck of the condyle. This is whole of the ramus, and that is the angle of the mandible. But if you see in front, just rotate it like this, and you see in front, and you will see this is the mental foramen right here. And then you will see just opposite side, it is approximately here. And this, uh, though both foramen are equal distance from the anterior teeth, right from here in sizes 
to incisor or canine to canine and then you see but when you move inside you see the inside and back side of the mandible there's a mandibular foramen and there is some mandibular fossa where the some mandibular gland is present right here is the um, mylohydrage where myeloid muscle is attached and that is the mandibular foramen but when you look at the superior level and you cut the portion of the uh, temporal area and see the mandibular fossa right here this is the part of the temporal bone and this is the area where the ends of the uh, condyle occur that is the articular tubercle that condyle cannot move beyond this articular bone this is a external opacity meatus that is a, just you come beneath it. this is the styloid process and that is the um, um, uh, sorry mastoid process this is styloid process so that is the actually the bones which are involved in our articulation and you see that these bones are very important to be uh, uh, you must know a b c of these bones now we move to the joint if you see joint like this there is a yellow color disc. There are two posterior laminis they are attached to the condyle. On the anterior surface, there is a, one superior head of the lateral um, pterygoid muscle is attached. And they, so this is the movement which is going on there in the TMJ. But when we see the parts, they have two parts. One is bony. And second is softer. We are going in detail. If we see the bony parts, they are glenoid fossa, there is condyle, and there is articular eminence. But when we go for the soft tissue, that is the articular disc, that is the capsule, and the ligament. These are the soft tissue um, portion, and that is what you see the bony. First, we start from the bony. In the bony parts, we have glenoid fossa, condyle, and articular eminence. Now, coming to the condyle, you see, just a, give to the uh, overall look. These uh, photographs are so wonderful, Jota. Don't confuse that they are too busy slides. No, just you see here, this is a coronoid process. That is mandibular condyle. This is styloid process that ends the lower portion. This is the mastoid process, external acoustic meatus. This is tympanic part, which is which contains the internal um, acoustic meatus, and like this. That is the mandibular fossa, which is part of the temporal bone. Articular tubercle where this ends the glenoid fossa, and that is the zygomatic arch. So this is all the story which we see in the three-dimensional computer tomography. But when you cut it, and after cutting in sagittal plane, you will see this is the coronoid process, which is right here. That is the so some mandibular condyle. Right here, that is the tympanic part of the temporal bone. You see here, tympanic part is actually a part of internal ear. That is the external acoustic meatus. This is wonderful bone that is called as the mastoid air cell. It reduces the weight of the skull but forms the bulk of the bone. But here I will get, uh, give you certain detail on this sagittal plane that uh, you see this is the article tubercle. This articular tubercle is so big inside. You see here it looks like very small. But when you cut it, you come to know that this articular area is basically very strong on the anterior aspect. It has a big bone. 
But when you look at this area, which is actually is the glenoid fossa or mandibular fossa, this is very thin here. And that is the middle cranial fossa. Just here is the middle cranial fossa. And you see very thin bone just lying above to the glenoid fossa. So that is the thing to be understood very nicely because this bone is very thin and if you are going to have the shock and if you are going to have the trauma at the chin you are going to have the all the trauma forces coming right there in the condyle and if this portion is hitting this area what will happen that this condyle will move into the skull in whole of my practice, I have never seen any condylar fracture which has penetrated the middle cranial fossa. Why? Number one thing, God has made the neck of the condyle very thin. So whenever there is trauma, this neck of the condyle fell first breaks. Secondly, God has made the lateral pterygoid muscle attachment right here. When there is trauma, this whole trauma is absorbed by the lateral pterygoid muscle, which is right here. It do not allow and do not let the condyle to push in itself into the middle cranial fossa. Then God has made the disc and the God has made this fossa uh, articular cartilage. What happens that due to this cartilage and this uh, a uh, flexible area, this condyle slips away and there is no chance of any injury to the brain. Now that is the this photograph which should be illustrated and which should be, be, uh, be uh, in your mind that uh, what is the temporomandibular giant basically is. Now we are coming to the condyle. The condyle is basically an Articular surface of the mandible. In the adult, it is 15 to 20 mm long, and it is from anterior to posterior or front to back, it is 8 to 10 mm thick. It is convex anterior posteriorly and mediolaterally. It is convex. How? Look at this. This is uh, the condyle placed right there in the fossa. And you see anteriorly, it is convex and posteriorly as well, it is convex. And superior surface, if you see, it is also convex. It is convex from all three dimensions. Area. This condyle has the entity to regulate itself in the temporal post. Now you see slightly detailed that this is the lateral pole and this is medial pole and these uh, this is generally 10 to 15 mm long average is that this area is slightly conical on the medial side and slightly flattened on the lateral side and a articular surface is strongly convex anteroposteriorly mediolaterally Thus has two poles, what is called a lateral pole and the medial pole. Lateral pole is more pointed on the posterior aspect and then does not extend. But the medial pole project forward and thicker and smoother, more rosy. Now, look at the medial pole right here and lateral pole right here. When we see from the just anteriorly, the articular surface is like this. That is the articular surface. Here is the portion which actually articulate during your movement. <coughs> Sorry. When you look at the posterior aspect, posterior surface, this surface is the only surface of the condyle which actually regulate or which actually um, and come in articulation. When we look at the surface of the giant, we see 
that giant cavity is right there and here starts the condyle and when we see the fibrous layer i have specially placed this slide for you that if you see the fibrous layer there are big big fibroblasts are present here this is the big big area which contains the fibroblastic activity all the time because it is a very good articulation surface all the time we need the fibrous tissue so, so god has created a area where the maximum air, but you say the population of the fibroblast are there now coming to the articular surface of the condyle now ladies and gentlemen concentrate this is the histopathology of the condylar head by the articular surface of the condylar head are the mandibular fossa that you say are always contain four distinct layer number one articular zone number two proliferative zone number three is the fibrocartilaginous zone and number four is the calcifying cartilaginous zone these are the four zone and i take every zone one by one now number one is the dense cartilaginous connective tissue this is the condyle that is the articular cartilage and that is the temporal bone i am talking of the condyle the condyle most serious surface is dense fibrous connective tissue having very less blood supply it has better ability to repair why because there are cluster of fibroblasts present there and there is always a reparative phenomena going on there good adaptation to the sliding if you move forward or backward it has good adaptability area it has a shock absorbing property because it is a fibrous in nature and less susceptible to the effects of the aging time as compared to that of other portion because it is going on repairing itself all the time now we are coming to second zone that is mainly the cellular zone this cellular zone is a very proliferative zone this is undifferentiated mesenchymal tissue this going on proliferating all the life this whole portion is proliferating all the life and it is a very very proliferative and active zone where the formation is going on all the year. the third zone is the cartilaginous zone the cartilage collagen fiber arranges itself into criss cross way and offer resistance against the compression and later forces this area this whole area is a cartilaginous inconsistency and having very good property of uh, shock absorbing but the problem is that with the passage of age it used to become very thin so that is the changes with the age and the last zone which is called as the deepest zone this deepest zone is basically is a junk of different cells having chondrocyte having chondroblast having osteoblast and it is active site for the remodeling activity of the bone as the growth proceeds as with the passage of time with the increase in the age this area become more and more mature more and more bony formation is there and that is going on with the passage of time and with the passage of age dear students now the second part of a temporomandibular joint which we are going to study is the glenoid fossa of the condyle condyle is basically uh, um, give its articulation with the mandibular fossa this mandibular fossa is basically is a part of the temporal bone which is the which for perform the articular surfaces the articular tubercle which is present just anterior to the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone is the last limit of the articulation 
if we look at this, that is the basic portion of the temporal mandibular uh, joint area, which is mandibular fossa, and that is the articular tubercle, which is the end of the joint. Looking at this area in a very cutely way, you see that on the outer surface, there is the end of the zygomatic arch. On the posterior surface, there is the external opacistic meatus. And on the medial surface, there are the different bones lying here. Now, anatomy of the glenoid fossa. Laterally, root of the zygomatic bone right here. Medial sphenoid spine. Anterior to the articular aminus up to here. Posteriorly separated by the squamotampanic area. And that is the tympanic membrane which ends the glenoid fossa like here. And superiorly, I have shown you in the sagittal section, it is separated by the middle cranial fossa by a very thin plate of the bone. Now, the third, many, very important thing is, is histology. That is the temporal bone area. This is the lining of the articular fossa. And that is the space of the article space. That is the, what you say, the articular surface of the glenoid fossa. Now, next is articular eminence. Articular eminence is the end point of the temporomandibular giant in the temporal fossa. This is elliptical in nature and is a, if you see in sagittal plane it is slightly curved 25 degree to a cruiser plane if you see that this is the cruiser plane and that is approximately it is 25 degree here and is for most of the articular surface this is articular tubercle this is fossa that is the Aminence or articular tubercle, which is right here. When it becomes the edentulus, it becomes very flat. And the fossa dip and the articular elevation become approximately equal to one another. Anterior limit is the summit of articular eminence, which is the transfer stage that extends as far as the articular tubercle. Okay, that is the end of the articular tubercle. That is the zygomatic anterior process starts and that is the glenoid fossa at a hole. When we see the articular eminence, the just anterior portion which form the, that is the temporal area, that is fibrocartilaginous zone, the proliferative zone that is articular surface and below that is the articular disc which is the not part of the articular eminence but this is the part of the articular zone ladies and gentlemen this is very important because when you see here the articular zone is very thick proliferative zone and fibrocartilaginous zone make a unity with the articular zone and it becomes very thickened in anterior respect of the articular cartilage. Now, these are the parts of the temporomandibular giant which, which we have studied with reference to bone. When we study the overall structure, that is the temporal mandibular bone as a unit, that is a superior level. It is the temporal bone, it is the inner fibrous layer, and that is the outer fibrous layer. This is the articular surface of the temporal bone. Now coming here, this is the articular surface of the condyle. This is the condylar fibrous covering. You see the fibrous covering both of superior and inferior level in the temporal bone as well, in the condylar bone as well. 
that is the condyle bony area and that is growth cartilage which we have described all four zones here now that is the bone superior that is the bone inferiorly and in between what is there in between this is the fibrous cartilage or articular cartilage or fibrocartilaginous area that is the cartilage in between them and above and below both having a space which is called as the superior joint space and inferior joint space superior joint cavity or inferior joint cavity ladies and gentlemen when we talking of the overall temporomandibular joint articulation of the uh, unit that means that there is a bony portion of the temporal area there is a portion of the uh, condyle area this portion of the articular cartilage area so that overall become a mandibular articulation unit now we see that we have covered the bony area now we are coming to the soft tissue in soft tissue we have three components articular disc capsule and ligament these are the three soft tissue portions of the condyle when we are talking of the ligaments you see this is the posterior ligament which is a portion of the capsule and if you see it is anteriorly and that is the hold uh, the capsular ligament it is surrounding superiorly as well as inferior and that covers uh, through all the region of the condyle right it is uh, attached to the neck of the condyle and then it goes medially laterally and anteriorly and superiorly like a balloon it is covering all the area of the temporomandibular joint and that is the capsular ligament a thin sleeve of the tissue completely surrounding the tnj from neck to the temporal bone or the synovial bone in this uh, capsular ligament there is condyle and there is uh, articular cartilage as well as that hold the synovial fluid it is so tight that it do not allow the synovial fluid to be leaked outside the uh, capsule capsule is loose above and slightly tight below it is fibroelastic in nature and is very highly highly vascular and innervated that is why you if you press it slightly in your condyle area you will feel pain because you are compressing the capsular ligament and which is very innervated now that is the picture of a, the capsular ligament it is slightly coming here and it is attached right here it is loose above but it is very tight at the area of the neck and in it is covering whole the area beneath there is the condyle and that is the glenoid fossa and this capsular ligament is attaching itself all the base now is the articular cartilage the articular cartilage is a wonderful portion which actually gave a clear cut movement of the condyle without any resistance articular cartilage is covered with the fibrocartilage it has a uh, two joint cavities upper and lower part and that is in between is the articular cartilage this articular disc is like this if you see when joint is at rest position this is temporal bone that is the condyle this is the disc or articular cartilage which is posteriorly attached with ligaments anteriorly attached with the ligaments and that is the superior joint cavity this is the inferior joint cavity and that is the attachment of the lateral pterygoid muscle now ladies and gentlemen when it start this is the rotation movement it is in the joint now it is a gliding movement 
when the joint is widely open and the condyles move forward it do not articulate directly with the bone the condylar disc used to move with the condyle and it is uh, articulating directly over the surface of the condyle these posterior two ligaments they are pushing uh, they push the condylar disc forward and they are the, there are the uh, um, superior head of the lateral trigoid muscle which is contracting and this is uh, contracting the condy uh, articular cartilage part and same when the maximum up height is reached here condyle cannot cross this limit and so that is the end of the articular cartilage that is the posterior surface that is the superior joint cavity see how much joint cavity is enlarged here there is joint cavity is very less but when it move this is very enlarged and see the inferior joint cavity it is slit like here but when you see it is here it is so much enlarged just by its slight opening but as it is maximum of um, open the cavity superior joint cavity is also enlarged and inferior joint cavity is also enlarged but what about this posterior portion this posterior portion contain, contains high vascular venous channels and this whole area become filled with the uh, blood and when it come back this whole blood drains away now function of the articular cartilage it helps to stabilize the tmj act as the shock absorber shape and thickness governed by the muscle forces controlling position of the mandible and the condyle is so beautifully designed architect by the almighty allah that its shape and thickness is so beautiful that it move with the muscles movement and it obeys the muscle order it reduces wear fractional wear is halved by separating the sliding and rotation movement these friction if this uh, slide is not there or this what you say sliding forces by the condylar cartilage is not there you see there is directly friction of the joint to the base of the brain or the infra temp middle temporal fossa and there will be severe headache and there will be pain so this articular disc is one of the very important protective barrier look at this this is the disc this is temporal bone this is external acoustic meatus jaw bone these are the ligament and you see anteriorly this is the lateral trigoid muscle superior head is attached with that of a disc and inferior head just is direct to go to the lateral trigoid plate and this is a no way if you go more detail just look at the condyle and you see this condylar area basically moves in this temporal uh, what you say glenoid fossa but when do you, do you see this photograph is uh, slightly enlarge this photograph and you will see that uh, this uh, photograph shows in the center it is the articular cartilage above yellow is the superior joint cavity inferior yellow is the inferior joint cavity and you see the movement of the fluid of the synovial fluid it is like this it is like this that is the basically joint cavity and that is the fibrous cartilage this is a, when you see uh, the surface it is roughly oval very firm and is fibrous in nature is a fibrocartilage between the condyle and temporal bone it used to retain but it has made its shape exactly over the condyle and the glenoid fossa it articulate according to the surface superior surface is exactly 
like the temporal fossa, inferior surface is exactly like the condylar head. It performs the hinging movement and gliding movement. If you look at this, you see this is the superior giant cavity, inferior giant cavity, and that is the articular disc. And this articular disc is attached, you see, posteriorly by the ligament and anteriorly by the ligament. If you look at this cartilage, this is anteriorly, you see, it is like the shape of the condyle. And inferiorly, it, it gives the bulk over the head and superior surface articulate with the temporal bone. That is the basically articular disc. Superior surface, you have seen it is saddle shape and inferior surface is concave because it has to accommodate the convex surface of the condyle. Anterior band is 2 mm, intermediate band is 1 mm, posterior band is 3 mm. Right, I will, I'm going to describe it. And retro disc region is most posterior, just I describe it here. <laughs> Look, this photograph is nice. See. There are three colors. And for the disc, you look at here. This red color is the anterior articular disc region, which is 2 mm thick. And then you come to yellow, that is intermediate zone, and that is 1 mm. And when you go to the posterior articular disc area, that is 3 mm. That means this articular cartilage is the thickest as the most posterior level, is the thinnest in the intermediate level, and it is intermediate or 2 mm in the anterior region. So, but when you move posteriorly, see the yellow area. This yellow area is intermediate and this intermediate is only 1 mm. So condyle has to rotate in middle portion. Anteriorly there is resistance, posteriorly there is resistance and there is relaxation for the condyle in the middle area. So the condyle used to articulate itself in the middle area. Now coming to the posterior portion of the slide, you see just at the level yellow uh, these blue areas two blue areas on the posterior side one is superior one is inferior and these two are the retro discal lamini these are the laminis which are attached to the posterior uh, articular disc region and they give attachment inferior retro discal lamina give attachment to the neck of the condyle but the superior give its attachment to the posterior aspect of the temporal fossa and that is how the disc is attached to the skull now i just give you brief retro discal posterior attachment the superior is very elastic which is attached to the temporal bone and uh, that is uh, generally elastic fiber. It gives the relaxation of, to the disc that it moves forward. Inferior retrodiscal lamina is very important. It is collagenous in nature and it is, has the large venous plexus which fill the blood as the condyle moves forward. These laminis contain vascular supply and having the very thick venous plexus that I have described already. So superior retrodiscal lamina, inferior retrodiscal lamina. Now you see this photograph again. See here, there are three zones that is anterior band, intermediate zone, and posterior band. The condyle is placed just in a rotation way in the posterior level, 
you see the latter pterygoid muscle is attached here right here you see these are the fibers of lateral pterygoid muscle this is a anterior band which is 2 mm this is middle portion of middle band 1 mm this is the posterior band which is 3 mm right here and this is the superior lamina this is inferior lamina and that is the space which is later on filled by the blood vessels right here okay and that is the basically concept we i have to give now coming here that is the medial disc area this is joint capsule attached superiorly right here by the temporal and neck of the condyle same as attached here from the condyle to the temporal bone that is the disc and the superior joint space inferior joint space this is the articular cartilage above and below and that is the coronal section this is the medial pole and that is the lateral same here by the cadaver and you see this is a anterior portion anterior band this is the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle which is attached to the anterior band of the cartilage this is generally 2 mm i am saying this portion is 2 mm then we are coming here that is the middle portion which is 1 mm this is the posterior portion which is 3 mm that is the anterior band which is 2 mm these are the muscles uh, lateral pterygoid head which is attached to the articular cartilage that is the posterior superior lamina that is the inferior lamina and this whole area is by the connective tissue and venous plexus now this is a, an other very beautiful uh, photograph showing the articular surface of the condyle here articular surface of the temporal bone right there and this whole yellow region is the condylar cartilage this is anterior attachment of the condylar cartilage which continues with the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle this is the medial uh, ligament this is the lateral ligament this is the superior lamina which is attached to the temporal bone this is the inferior lamina which will be attached to the neck of the condyle now you get the orientation of the uh, full articular cartilage how it is placed in the uh, uh, glenoid fossa superiorly inferiorly and see the articular surface are so nicely colored that these are the only articular surfaces which used to glide with this surface of the articular cartilage now if you cut the portion and you see this is the articular cartilage this is posterior level this is anterior this is the uh, fibers of the lateral pterygoid muscle this is the lateral portion this is the medial portion and that is the elevation of the beneath you can see the condyle is visible and superior it will be articulating with the temporal fossa another picture inferior surface you can see that it is concave because it has to glide with the surface of the condyle and superior surface it is convex because it has to glide with the surface of the temporal bone temporal fossa now this is another diagrammatic presentation of the condylar cartilage 3 mm 1 mm 2 mm this is anterior portion this go with the 
superior hydraulic condyle. This is the posterior laminis which are attached superior and inferior. This is the whole cartilage which is the called as the bilaminar zone. Now we are coming to the portion of the ligaments. To say I, I will continue up to the synovial membrane and fluid, and a, a, a third session will be on muscular component, inshallah. Thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sorry that we have a small pause uh, that, that I have to just uh, get the permission from the organizer that whether we can continue our point. Now, next is the uh, ligaments. There's a very important ligaments are attached with the condyle, condyle or fossa, and sometimes with the disc. These are ligaments are very important. One important ligament unit is called automandibular ligament. Ladies and gentlemen, this is very, very important to understand. The discolaminar ligaments are called as DML runs from the malleus to the meter, medial retrodiscal tissue of the TMJ. Understand. It's a very difficult to understand sometimes, but uh, I will make you easy. The anterior malleolar ligament runs from the malleus to the lingula of the mandible. Now try to understand. The malleus is a part of middle ear. So these ligaments, they are coming from the malleus and they are coming to the lingula of the mandible or the medial retrodiscal tissue of the TMJ. These two ligaments. That is why there is problem. That is why there is problem that sometime in temporomandibular giant dysfunction syndrome, TMD, the patient reports to you with the tinnitus or ringing sound in the ear. And we refer the patient to ENT, which is not actually the problem of the ENT. It is problem of the temporomandibular giant dysfunction syndrome. It has been proposed that the temporomandibular giant disorder may stretch the DML and AML affecting the middle ear structure and equilibrium. That is very, very important. That the temporomandibular giant indirectly holds the equilibrium parameters like the eustachian tube. It is also going like this. So I just give you the explanation that the if I cut the superior level of the condyle and go posteriorly, cutting from the middle ear and reaching to the middle part of the ear or internal acoustic meatus, what I will see? You will see this is the middle cranial fossa and I have cut the middle cranial fossa and looking from the middle cranial fossa and that is my condyle. From above, I have cut the portion of the middle cranial fossa and I am just looking from superior level to the condyle. And in this region, I steer forward going on cutting the posterior aspect of the features part of the temporal bone in the brain. Now, when we cut the petrous part of the temporal bone, what we see, very important thing, is the number seven. That is the genetically ganglion and tensor villi penitentine muscle. That is here. These both are right here. And when we go more anteriorly, you see a very thin nerve, and that is called a tympanum. 
right here and anterior to carotid tympani we have four and five this is dml and five is aml these both ligaments they are attached right here the posterior aspect of the condylar area right here and they move downward crossing the condylar area attach themselves to the disc as well as the sphenomandibular ligament now i go to just forward that uh, what happens to other ligaments these instead of these auto ligament there are two groups of the ligament which are major ligament and minor ligament one ligament i have described already the major ligaments are temporomandibular ligaments or lateral ligaments one is outer oblique portion what is that outer oblique portion forms over the top of the capsular ligament strengthens the lateral part of the capsular ligament its fibers are directly downward and backward i just show the picture this is the lateral ligament these are the external acoustic meter and this is capsule this is zygomatic arch that is stylet process and here you see temporomandibular giant oblique ligament attached superiorly with the zygomatic arch inferiorly to the inferior aspect of the neck of the condyle and that is called the temporomandibular giant oblique band look at this and you see that is portion right here this is the lateral oblique ligament again you see i play it again this is the joint when open this is the area which is lateral ligament which is attached right here now inner horizontal and transverse portion these are two major ligament which give attachment to the joint these are very important transverse and oblique ligament these are very strong ligament giving attachment to the disc now we are coming to the minor ligament why we say it minor the minor is those ligament which has no direct connection with the temporomandibular joint functional area but they are away from the functional area but they give all the accessory but you say uh, protective barrier to the temporomandibular joint number one is the stylomandibular ligament it limits the protrusion so phenomandibular ligament it limits the distension of the mandible in anterior direction the stylomandibular ligament is you see like this it is attached to the lateral surface of the stylet process and posterior border of the mandible starting from the stylet process going down to the inferior portion of the mandible it separates the submandibular and parotid salivary gland it's very important boundary of the submandibular area so that is the stylet process that is stylomandibular ligament and that is the attachment up to lower portion outside this is the parotid gland and inside the gland of the submandibular here you see mesially this is stylet process and that is the stylomandibular ligament and it limits the protrusion of the mandible it do not uh, let the mandible to exaggerate beyond its limit it gives the check that mean indirectly it is supporting the condyle then is the if you see here that is phenomandibular ligament right here 
now coming to the sphenomandibular ligament it is attached superior to the spine of the sphenoid and inferiorly to the lingula of the mandibular foramen these fibers are directly downward and outward ladies and gentlemen it is like this this is sphenomandibular ligament the spine of the sphenoid bone it is coming down and it is attached right here to the lingula beneath it is the some mand uh, mandibular foramen and that is sphenomandibular ligament and that is the style of mandibular ligament now we are coming to the description it is like this you see attached to the sphenoid bone and it is a duchy stylomandibular that is stylet process and that is the this is the both ligaments which are attached here now another very good interpretation is we are coming to the back side here you see stylet process and there is the stylo mandibular ligament coming to the angle of it now you see sphenomandibular ligament look at the stylet process and the end of the mandible and now you look look at the sphenoid spine of the sphenoid bone and that is the lingula and when we see clinically this uh, ligament is attached superiorly by the sphenoid bone spine of the sphenoid bone and inferiorly it is attached to the ling now the very important topic is the synovial membrane and its fluids which it contain synovial membrane all the tmj is enclosed in a fibrous capsule lined by the synovial membrane this synovial membrane is rich of blood supply and also contain a rich lymphatic vessels synovial fluid fills the both joint cavities superior joint cavity as well as the inferior joint cavity it is a clear and slightly straw colored viscous fluid it carries the nutrition to the from the vascular area to the avascular area of the joint and supplies the oxygen supplies the nutrition to this area clear the uh, tissue debris caused by the normal wear and tear this synovial fluid if we rule out there are macrophages there are other phagocytes there they are always doing their work as a phagocytic activity removing the foreign bodies from the wear and tear the lubricant and articulating surfaces having two mechanism these are lubricated by two may one is called the boundary um, lubrication and second is called weeping lubrication what are those boundary lubrication boundary lubrication always happen when joint is moved and synovial fluid is forced from one area of the cavity to the another that mean there is superior joint cavity boundary and inferior joint cavity boundary when the joint moves this fluid move from one joint cavity to the second joint cavity and it lubricates all the boundaries of superior level and inferior level of the joint second is the weeping lubrication that is very interesting the the membrane which is forming the uh, synovial uh, the membrane which is uh, all the synovial membrane is the structural membrane this membrane has the capability to absorb the synovial fluid and then remove it in droplet way and this droplet way is a very good example of the weeping so the with the movement this drops these drops come out from this cartilaginous area and what happen that uh, it give the surface lubrication there are two big lubrication one is boundary lubrication which give over overall lubrication of the joint cavity and second is the surface lubrication 
that is by the weeping mechanism the synovial fluid comes from the two surfaces first from the plasma by dialysis and second by the secretion from type a and type 2 type of synovocytes with the volume of not more than 0.0.5 0.5 ml this is the quantity which is present right there however contrast radiography study has estimated that the upper compartment could hold approximately 1.2 ml of fluid without under pressure being created while lower joint cavity have the really less capability and that is 0.5 ml ladies and gentlemen that mean that if we want to give any medicine or any injection we cannot give anything in the lower joint space that mean the upper joint space have the more capability for retaining the synovial fluid and retaining the extra pressure up to 1.2 ml which is a very good volume so it is the advice to always when whenever there is temporomandibular joint dysfunction syndrome or any matter when you like to inject something in the temporomandibular joint you must inject into upper joint cavity that is very important and that very mandatory so that is the hope with the uh, have the sources of lubrication now what contain the synovial fluid it is clear straw colored viscous fluid having a big capillary network in the synovial membrane these capillary network actually secretes hyaluronic acid which is highly viscous and may contain free cell like macrophages and it provide the phagocytic activity and cleansing mechanism in the synovial membrane these uh, actually fluids have the lubrication function for all the articular surface for uh, giving nutrition to the avascular area of the joint the avascular area of the joints are the articular disc itself it's a fibrocartilage its anterior portion middle portion and posterior portion has very less vascular supply even anterior and middle portion has absolutely no vascular supply and they are getting all the nutrition from diffusion and that is by the synovial fluid and posterior portion posterior laminis has to vascular supply and as the uh, to good nerve supply as well but the anterior portion has to get these all nutrition oxygen and everything from the synovial fluid and that is the superior joint cavity inferior joint cavity this is the articular disc and these areas are being supplied by the articular fluids and this area as well now innervation of the temporomandibular joint that is the most innervation are by auricular temporal nerve which is the branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve fifth cranial nerve additional nerve just supply is by deep temporal and mesenteric nerve which is also a sub supply mesenteric is the supply from the temporal um, um, uh, trigeminal nerve as well our surfaces had fossa and cap um, capsule except few portion of the this they are devoid of innervation now that is the innervation supply that is the fifth cranial nerve and that is the auricular temporal nerve that is deep temporal nerve and that is mesenteric nerve mesenteric nerves used to supply the anterior portion of the temporal mandibular joint and the, to some extent neck of the area the auricular temporal nerve posterior area of the all of the structure of the temporal mandibular joint but the medial pole is generally supplied by the deep temporal nerve if we cut the disc and we see it like this 
this is the disk area we have cut it this is the coronoid process we have seen in three dimensional area this is the condyle from one side this is condyle on the second side this is we have cut it and we have make it flat this is the condyle this is the arch and this is the coronoid process this is mandible and this is mandible as well on the medial side cut portion and this is condyle that is the coronoid process now that is the anterior attachment which is will be continue with the superior fibers of the lateral pterygoid muscle this is the posterior where is the superior lamina and inferior lamina att attached that is the auricular temporal nerve coming from the foramen ovale and giving posteriorly you see and laterally you see their junk of nerve supply and on the anterior portion you see the masseteric nerve and the medial portion you will see here only the deep temporal nerve so that is the disc area which is being enervated by this mechanism auricular temporal nerve coming from the medial side and the, from the posterior it moves up and from here it give branches to the posterior aspect of the condylar region and this is the disc and the, this is the anterior portion of the condylar region are being supplied by the masseteric deep temporal lateral portion is being supplied by the branches of the auricular temporal nerve and very less nerve supply is supplied by the posterior medial aspect that is generally also by the auricular temporal this is the innervation of the temporomandibular joint disc area and the joint area now coming to the blood supply of the temporomandibular joint there are four arterial supplies to the joint the main supply as you understand is the carotid arteries there superficial temporal middle meningeal and internal maxillary these are the branches directly from the external carotid deep auricular anterior tympanic and ascending pharyngeals are also the branches which is giving supply directly to the tmj tmj is also supplied by one branch from the inferior alveolar artery but they remember one thing very clearly that there is absolutely no blood supply within the capsule when looking at the arterial junk of the vascular supply of the tmj you see that is the condyle that is the maxillary artery coming and giving it 16 branches and these branches some are outside to tmj and sometimes are inside to tmj giving supplies to the middle meningeal artery and going to the pterygoid this is the superficial temporal artery then these all are giving their branches to temporal mandibular joint you see there's a network of vascular supply given to the temporal mandibular joint by all these big big vessels look at this as well you see the main external carotid is going up and here is the deep auricular branch of the maxillary supplying to the temporal mandibular joint anterior tympanic and also the few branches from the inferior alveolar and that is also one very good description that here is going on the in uh, um, external carotid and external carotid before uh, uh, giving its branches to the uh, superficial temporal it gives supply to the area of the temporomandibular joint ladies and gentlemen from here we ends the today's session of the temporomandibular joint anatomy and that is our part 2 in the part 3 we will inshallah cover the muscle mastication as well as we will cover 
Uh, in detail, we will go for the primary muscle and secondary muscles, and we will also go for the mechanism of movement of the temporomandibular joint in detail. If you have any question, you can ask directly to uh, me. It is over. Uh, today, I just, uh, ladies and gentlemen, listening to me, I'm going very fast and just look at the slides. Just very keenly look at the slide, the topic which we have covered today. That's bone of the joint. Then when we have seen the TMJ, when we have seen the three-dimensional, then we have oriented the bones. Then we have discussed the part of the TMJ, bone and soft tissue. Then we have described the bone and soft tissue. First, we have gone for the bone. We have described the outer surface of the giant. Then we have gone for the condyle. And after condyle, we have discussed the condyle anatomy in detail. And after that, we have gone for the histology of the condyle. And we have discussed all the four zones. Then we have gone for the glenite fossa. We have covered the glenite fossa, its boundaries, and its uh, histopathology. Then we have gone to articular eminence. We have covered the articular eminence histology as well. Then we have gone overall articular unit, and that articular unit will move forward to the soft tissue. And in soft tissue, we have covered the ligaments in ligament, a capsular ligament. Then we have gone for the articular disc in detail, its positioning, its function, its uh, uh, all the morphology, and it's all related subjects and especially its zones, its attachments, its posterior, anterior, and its bands, anterior, middle, and posterior bands. And then we have gone for its uh, detailed description with uh, articulation, its surfaces, so, uh, posterior, inferior. Then we have uh, seen the articular disc in detail. Then is the ligaments. We have gone for this automandibular ligament detail. Then we have covered the temporomandibular uh, ligaments and the lateral ligaments, which is the some, first is the temporal oblique ligament. Then we have gone for the transverse ligament. Then we have gone for the major stylomandibular ligament. Then we have uh, covered the sphenomandibular ligament. And we have gone for the detailed anatomy of that. Then we have discussed the synovial membrane, synovial lubrication mechanism, its uh, sources, and what is the function of the uh, synovial area. And lastly, we have discussed the innervation and uh, posterior, middle, and anterior innervation, all the cut portion detail of the innervation. Then we have uh, discussed the blood supply and blood supply the, from all the vessel deeper and middle. The next time we are going to cover the muscle of mastication and secondary muscle. This uh, uh, we have covered today. Just I have uh, gone in hurry to uh, just make the summary what we have uh, read today. Now come, uh, coming to the uh, 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 question with the gentleman asked me that the clinical aspects of the temporal mandibular joint. Uh, you have seen so many times that I am giving you the hints of the clinical diseases like temporal mandibular joint dysfunction syndrome, like the ligament injuries, like uh, the, the trauma to the chain and like this. The, these are the few points which are related to the anatomy of the temporomandibular joint. But I am not giving absolutely the diseases of temporomandibular joint. Inshallah, we are going to cover all the diseases of the temporomandibular giant. And inshallah, we will continue with reference to temporomandibular giant series. Thank you everyone for kind listening. Our second session of anatomy of TMJ by Dr. Arshad Mahmood Malik is over. We will continue towards session third within a few days. You can subscribe our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook page so that you can be updated with latest online lecture series from Association of International Dentistry. Thank you again from whole team of AID with best regards. Allah Hafiz.